Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another webinar in Khan Masiel Carey's 2016 webinar series. Uh, this is Eric Khan. I'm joined today by my partners, uh, Kara Masiel and Nick Scala, um, chair of our labor and employment practice and co-chair of our MSHA practice. Uh, we're delighted today to be able to uh, cover sort of a subject that spans all of the uh, uh, different areas of expertise of our firm, uh, and a particularly the uh, timely and very interesting issues associated with this year's presidential election. I think probably we can all agree, whatever we think about the candidates, whatever we think about this election, this is the most interesting election cycle that, uh, that we've ever seen. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the OSHA, Labor and Employment, and MSHA impacts of the 2016 presidential election. Uh, we'll introduce ourselves real quick and then we'll jump into the three different uh, subject matters. One of the faceless voices that you will uh, hear today is Eric Kahn. I'm one of the founding partners of Kahn Masiel Carey and I chair the firm's national uh, OSHA workplace safety practice group. Uh, my practice focuses on all aspects of occupational safety and health law. Uh, from assisting clients to managing uh, OSHA inspections to um, uh, the full range of litigation uh, against OSHA in the context of an enforcement action. I started my practice uh, 16 years ago, practicing alongside the former first general counsel of the OSH Review Commission, and since that time have done nothing but workplace safety and health, primarily dealing with matters involving OSHA, federal OSHA, but also the state OSH programs U.S. Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board and the Environmental Protection Agency when their um, jurisdiction overlaps with OSHA. I also work with employers proactively to develop safety and health programs, to audit safety and health programs, uh, and we write and speak extensively on safety and health topics. I'll have my uh, partner, Kara, introduce herself. Thanks, Eric. I am also a founding partner uh, here at the firm, and I chair the National Labor and Employment Practice. I represent employers in all aspects of the employment relationship, both at the uh, litigation level, state and, and local and federal litigation, um, under the ADA, the FLSA, all the myriad um, employment-related um, laws and regulations that impl implicate the workplace, um, as well as affirmative action issues. I also counsel employers proactively on how to stay out front of these emerging issues and making sure that they're doing right by their employees to be in compliance with federal and state law and emerging local laws. And I advocate for employers before the federal agencies here in Washington, D.C. Um, and be able to be in a unique position for our clients. I'm really at the heart of the, of the government and a lot, a lot of the topics we'll be talking about today. And I will let Nick introduce himself. Good afternoon. This is uh, Nick Scala. I am the co-chair of the uh, National MSHA practice group here at Comasiel Carey. Um, we represent mine operators around the country uh, during inspections and investigations and uh, subsequent litigation with the Mine Safety and Health Administration. Uh, additionally, uh, I work with companies in a similar vein to Eric and Kara in that we work on proactive solutions to safety and health compliance, um, as well as the normal defense work. Uh, prior to practicing law, uh, I worked in the mining and construction industries and I'm a certified mine safety professional through the uh, International Society of Mine Safety Professionals. And with that, I think we will uh, get the substantive portion of the webinar going. Okay, great. So we're going to start with my section and talk a little bit about labor and employment law impacts. I'm going to turn it over then to Eric to cover OSHA regulatory and enforcement impacts. And Nick will close out the, the hour with MSHA regulatory and enforcement impact. So there are many ways I think that this presidential election has been historical with novel issues and the candidates agendas being discussed by families at the dinner table, by employees at the water cooler, and by business owners and executives in the boardroom. But it also can be historical for the single fact that not since the election of of George H.W. Bush in the late 1980s has one political party held office for more than eight consecutive years. If Hillary Clinton is elected, um, which most of the pundits and the, certainly the, the betting uh, rooms out in Vegas think is going to happen, there will be continu continuity to the Democratic Party um, holding the White House that hasn't been seen again since the 80s. 
which would really mean that Clinton would be in a unique position to swiftly push ahead President Obama's priorities, which he outlined, including overtime pay, increasing pay equity, and expanding the definition of joint employment. You know, President Obama had been faced with a Republican-controlled Congress for much of his presidency, and he was able to demonstrate bypassing the legislative process and using his executive office to impact labor law through the use of federal regulations and executive orders. And I think that Secretary President Clinton will be consistent in following the same path that President Obama has already directed with these executive agencies, all of which have been fairly effective at implementing his agenda. At the legislative le um, level, you know, President Clinton has said in myriad debates and also, you know, on her website, she really wants to promote, you know, working families, uh, pay discrimination, raising the minimum wage, all of which is going to require, for the most part, a mandate in Congress. Um, we'll see what happens um, with Congress, if there is a shift in Congress, both at the House level or even at the Senate level. Um, but certainly changing these laws will require there be uh, a Democratic-controlled uh, Congress. Um, and we're not yet sure if that's going to be a situation. So she may also have to rely on the executive agencies to promote her labor agenda. The Paycheck, Fa the Paycheck Fairness Act, which has been pending in Congress for a while, punishes employers for retaliating against workers who share wage information and really puts the justification on employers as to why someone is paid less and allows workers to sue for wage discrimination. With that being stalled in Congress, we have seen many um, states and other localities start to pass similar pay transparency, pay discrimination, equal pay laws. And then we've certainly seen the administrative agencies, the EEOC in particular, focus on this issue, which we expect will continue. You know, she, uh, Secretary Clinton said that she's president. She wants to establish 12 weeks of paid family leave, so taking what is currently the Family and Medical Leave Act, which requires 12 weeks of unpaid leave, she would make that leave paid, um, which would be you know, one of the most generous paid leave laws um, to come out even across the country. She also wants to limit child care expenses to 10% of the household income by investing in child care and providing tax relief to working families. And then finally, on the legislative agenda, she favors minimum wage. Um, she's gone back and forth about the $15, really $15 federal minimum wage. She says she favors raising it to $12, although she wouldn't be opposed to a $15 an hour minimum wage, although she really does support the local um, and state efforts to go any higher than, than $12 an hour. In the first 100 days, we heard um, Hillary Clinton say at the most recent presidential debate that she will put millions of dollars into an infrastructure plan to Congress, including comprehensive immigration reform package, which would include a pathway to citizenship for those in the U.S. without authorization. You know, and that's significant because I think this is one of the areas that uh, Secretary Clinton and Donald Trump diverge completely on with respect to how they would handle immigration reform, and that really does have an impact on labor and employment. It could significantly alter the ability and the workforce and the labor force um, for uh, many of the businesses around the country, a large number of industries that rely on those individuals to perform jobs and what would happen if, if those individuals are no longer um, in the United States. She also has supported a child tax credit. Um, currently, parents receive 15 cents of every dollar earned above $3,000 as a credit, and she proposes increasing that to 45 cents of every dollar earned to a maximum benefit of $2,000 for children under the age of five. Donald Trump, on the other hand, as we've talked about, he doesn't have and hasn't articulated a, a clear or um, labor agenda. Um, he focuses on you know, creating 25 million new jobs through an economic plan and to grow the economy um, at an annual rate of 3.5%. Similarly to uh, Hillary Clinton, he likes paid leave, although he's limited it to six weeks of paid maternity leave, which would also need a legislative uh, change to the law. And with minimum wage, he's been sort of all over the map. He says he'd raise it to at least $10, 
Um, he also then said he'd eliminate the minimum wage um, and leave it up to the state. Other times, uh, he has said he wouldn't raise it. Um, overall, he's been pretty critical of the regulations and the executive orders that he sees as really harming the ability to do the job and add jobs. In the most, um, or one of the presidential debates, he accused Clinton of planning to, quote, regulate these businesses out of existence, end quote. He really has pledged as president to reverse most of the executive orders and agency reg regulations, which could be harder to accomplish um, than, than it appears to and so we'll just have to wait and see. Certainly not something that he could do day one. He has talked about promising to repeal the Affordable Care Act as well, um, and as I mentioned, you know, deporting millions of immigrants. So there's a lot that still um, seems like it would be both an uphill battle, um, again, with required uh, legislation, um, depending on the really the outcome of the of Houses of Congress, and if one house or the other would remain under either GOP control or um, flip over to the other side. So really, I think what we can expect to see um, at the end of the day is under a, a Hillary Clinton presidency, more legislation by regulation and executive order. The, um, the agencies have been incredibly active in the last several years pushing President Obama's labor agenda, and as I said, they have been fairly effective. Um, getting a rule in making out and other um, executive orders and other changes to the law really has put a strangle on a lot of business owners confused and struggling on how to you know, comply with, with the wide variety of rules and regulations that are coming out from the federal um, from the federal agencies. The EEOC, similar to the issues that the uh, Obama uh, and the Obama administration and even Hillary Clinton has said, will be focused, I think, on equal pay and LGBT rights uh, in the first two, two years of, of a president, um, Clinton presidency. Similarly, with Department of Labor, we, we see the new overtime rules that are coming into effect December 1st. I don't see any at this point, any slowdown short of a court action that would enjoin the rules. I don't think that's likely. Um, so everyone should be ready to start to come into compliance with the overtime rules as of December 1st. And certainly if Hillary Clinton is elected, those will, uh, those will certainly go into effect um, and continue. And then as we've seen with the Department of Labor and the other agencies heavily focused on joint employer and misclassification efforts of independent contractors. We will start to see um, you know, more cases, more, uh, more lawsuits being filed by joint employers or two, you know, co-employers over employment-related liability, and I think that will continue. The National Labor Relations Board you know, is, a, is an agency all to its own. It, um, that is the agency where typically the president's party carries a three to two majority. Um, and so the board law has been known to flip-flop back and forth, either in favor of organized labor or management, depending on which party holds executive office. The NLRB's general counsel, Richard Griffin, is set to expire his term in 2017. So the next president will have a, a large impact on the shaping of federal labor law uh, before the National Labor Relations Board. We certainly think that if uh, Clinton is elected, that pendulum will continue to swing further in the direction of organized labor, uh, whereas uh, Donald Trump would probably need time to advance a labor agenda, get nominees to the board, um, whereas, and again, Clinton would probably be able to really build on all of the rulemaking and board law that the Obama administration has laid um, before the NLRB. Just in the past couple of years, the, the NLRB has been viewed as one of the most progressive labor boards in decades. Just uh, last August, they issued a landmark decision um, which loosened its definition of joint employer, uh, which the Department of Labor agrees with. It's also made it much easier for unions to organize um, both temporary workers and regular workers through their speedy election rules. And so we think that will only continue with a Hillary Clinton presidency. She has supported a strong labor movement, making clear her belief that when unions are strong, America is strong as well. I think one of the probably, when it comes to influencing the law um, and the state of the law, it's going to be the federal judiciary. 
is where either candidate is going to have their greatest impact. The next president could name as many as four justices to the Supreme Court, um, the highest total since the Nixon administration. This would raise a significant ideological shift on the court because, as you can see right now, we have a split between four conservative justices and four liberal justices. Trump, um, in the most recent presidential debate, in the very first question that was asked to both candidates, he clearly articulated that he would favor conservative justices in his appointments, those that would keep the um, constitutionalism and the originality of the Constitution and not seek to interpret it through um, new rights um, and new laws, whereas Clinton and obviously is going to be selecting more liberal judges. She has emphasized workers' rights having justices that understand workplaces and workers, um, and we would expect to see a, a big expansion of labor and employment rights through the court if she is elected. A couple of, um, you know, kind of interesting uh, cases that are pending uh, in terms of shaping employment law for years to come before the Supreme Court. We've got um, the Burwell case, which challenged the Affordable Care Act's contraceptive mandate. That court ultimately issued a decision that directed the parties to work out a compromise, but the case could easily return when a new justice is nominated. And then we also expect the justices to hear a case with respect to class actions and the legality of class action waivers, particularly in arbitration agreements. It's said that this is the type of case that has the potential to be one of the most important, important labor and employment cases in years. So that's just a few of the labor and employment agendas for both candidates and where we think it might be having the greatest impact. I think certainly the federal courts, both at the highest level of the Supreme Court, but also the federal judiciary around the country, the next president will have a significant impact in naming um, both federal district court judges and federal um, court of appeal judges that will really shape labor and employment law um, for, for years to come. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Eric Kahn, and he's going to talk about OSHA's regulatory enforcement efforts. Thanks, Kara. I think you'll probably hear a pretty consistent theme through all three of our discussions today that probably what you're likely to see under a Clinton administration, if that's what we uh, end up with after uh, Election Day, is a carryover of the Obama administration. And I think that is uh, absolutely the case in the context of uh, OSHA. Uh, thinking about the regulatory agendas of, of both of the candidates, uh, you know, I think you could almost take um, uh, President Obama's last labor uh, regulatory agenda, and certainly the OSHA component of that regulatory agenda, and just carry it over almost verbatim. Uh, and it will look an awful lot like a Clinton regulatory agenda at the beginning of her administration. I'll highlight a couple of significant components of the regulatory agenda that we all sort of looked at throughout the Obama term as, you know, a, a pipe dream or certainly not something that was ever going to get done during his administration. But now we need to think about it differently. If we do have another four years or possibly eight years of a Democratic administration, those things that didn't look realistic – uh, look a whole lot more realistic now. Uh, for example, the second item on this uh, bullet list, the uh, updates to uh, permissible exposure limits. Now, the majority of OSHA's uh, chemical permissible exposure limits were adopted in 1971, basically uh, adopting industry consensus standards when, in, when OSHA was born. Very few of those standards have been updated over the years. Very few new uh, Chemical-specific standards have been introduced uh, through the rulemaking process. Uh, there was an effort uh, back in the late 1980s to try to do sort of a wholesale update of the PELs for a lot of different chemicals. I think it was 200 or so different chemicals uh, and added new exposure limits uh, for 160 or 170 chemicals that were previously not regulated. Uh, that rulemaking was carried out and implemented but was promptly challenged and, uh, and vacated as not following the necessary steps of the Administrative Procedure Act, essentially saying that kind of a blanket or wholesale change to a bunch of different PELs uh, doesn't work. You need to do an individual analysis, uh, the complex analysis, cost and benefit, feasibility, and all of those different components for each chemical, for each PEL, uh, which would be uh, yeah, an unbelievable and perhaps impossible undertaking 
or the government. So back in 2014, just a couple of years ago, uh, President Obama's OSHA um, introduced a request for information, seeking input from industry stakeholders, from industry, from unions, from scientists, from anybody who had good ideas for how OSHA might improve the way it regulates um, uh, chemical exposures. And you know, we, we looked at that and said, well, this is an interesting academic exercise, but making any effective change to permissible exposure limits is certainly not going to happen during Obama's tenure. But now if we have a carryover or continuation in the Democratic administration under a President Hillary Clinton, we think this initiative would get legs. Uh, it has been an extremely high priority of the agency. Um, so we think that this is something that would be um, advanced uh, during a Clinton administration, finding a way to either do wholesale changes uh, to all of the Pells or to find a way to very effectively and efficiently do numerous uh, rulemakings to address Pells that, the, uh, that OSHA and many uh, professional safety and health professionals consider to be outdated and ineffective. Another area where I think OSHA under a Clinton administration uh, would, would take off uh, where we've seen stagnation under the Obama administration is a combustible dust rule. Uh, back in uh, the 2006, the U.S. Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board, the CSB, conducted a study evaluating uh, past combustible dust incidents, and they identified 280 or so combustible dust incidents uh, that killed about 119 workers and injured more than 700 others. Uh, and based on those findings, the CSB recommended and has been more or less hounding uh, OSHA uh, since that time to implement a, a one-size-fits-all combustible dust rule. Uh, the Obama administration uh, theoretically started the process. They put it on their regulatory agenda. Uh, they did an adv advance notice of proposed rulemaking, uh, but not much else has happened on that front. Uh, I do think that the... Um, uh, it is likely the conference has been muted. Uh, notice about background noise from other people's lines. I think I've just muted all those lines, so hopefully that clears up the problem. Uh, I thought they were muted already. My apologies. Um, if you have any, any other tro trouble with audio, let me know. Um, the, um, the idea, though, with the combustible dust rule is I think that with a new administration, a new Democratic administration, and perhaps even with some help in, the, um, in Congress, if Congress were to change face as well, uh, that we might see some real activity on the combustible dust front. Um, the one thing that has happened in the background is that um, there have been industry consensus standards being developed that would be more of a one-size-fits-all approach, and I think that may um, provide some sort of roadmap for OSHA in a rulemaking process, and I could see Hillary Clinton uh, digging into that. Uh, you see the list here of other items that I think the Clinton administration would pick up the banner from the Obama administration and run with, uh, but one in particular uh, that we'll talk about in more detail later is a possibility of a new ergonomics rule. Uh, and, and those of you who have followed OSHA for years may recall uh, a midnight rulemaking by President Bill Clinton that was promptly uh, uh, squashed by President Bush and the Republican Congress shortly after the next uh, election when President uh, George W. Bush was elected. Um, and since that time, OSHA has sort of been wandering in the, w in the woods find, trying to find a way to enforce ergonomics issues, which is a very significant safety and health issue through, almost throughout all industries. Um, and I could see certainly a President Hillary Clinton uh, looking to vindicate uh, a major piece of um, uh, regulatory progress of her husband, uh, that was killed by the Republicans, perhaps resurrecting that and trying to get some vindication. So we'll talk a little bit about more of that, more of that in a moment. But let's talk about Trump. You know, what might his regulatory agenda look like? If you ask him, I'm sure he would say that it would be huge. It would be the best. But you know, what does that mean? You know, I think you, you would get no, no real clear picture of that, certainly not during a campaign season. Uh, and he really hasn't spoken much at all about uh, workplace safety and health. And I think a part of the reason for that is he comes from a different place than traditional candidates. Uh, he is a businessman, and in particular, a businessman who is involved in construction. And as a result, he's got history with OSHA. 
uh, and not great history. You know, he's, he's been cited, some of his projects, some of his uh, hotels and casinos have had serious incidents um, and kind of, um, uh, you know, a, a regulatory enforcement history with OSHA. So if he came out and really started pushing some of that on the um, campaign trail, I could see that being spun and put back on him and highlighting some of his history there. So that's, I think, the reason why we're not hearing him talk much about worker safety issues specifically. Uh, but what we have heard him talk quite a bit about is how he would handle sort of the regulatory environment generally. And I think we could extrapolate that to what a Trump presidency and what a Trump OSHA would look like. Uh, the thing that he's talking about, you know, unlike on the left side of the screen, the different regulatory um, issues that a President Clinton might try to advance, uh, a President Trump would go the other direction. He's talked about a moratorium on all new regulations and then a serious concerted effort very shortly after taking over the White House to cut regulations. And that would be, you know, I, I think there's a lot of good candidates uh, of regulatory action that have been taken um, during the Obama administration and a lot right here at the end of the Obama administration that would be prime targets for a Trump OSHA uh, to go in and reverse, um, to, you know, re replace, uh, repeal and replace, or maybe just repeal. Um, and, and, you know, his, his platform, the Republican Party's platform, and the way President, uh, uh, President Trump, I think, would uh, operate is to try as, as best he could to decrease the federal government's presence in the workplace. And that would be from setting wages uh, to setting you know, work, workplace standards, uh, and, and I think certainly to dealing with worker safety issues, which is an issue that Trump is uniquely um, familiar with because of his role in sort of a construction uh, background on the business side. So what would a Clinton workplace safety uh, administration look like? What, what would be the things, where do I think her guiding principles would come from and what does her history look like in dealing with worker safety issues that might inform what a, um, a Clinton administration might look like from a safety and health standpoint? Uh, we do know that a, uh, um, a Senator Clinton was active and very involved uh, in worker safety issues. Uh, she was um, on the Employment and Workplace Safety Subcommittee of the Health Committee, uh, the, um, you know, the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee in the Senate, which has oversight over OSHA. So this is an area that, you know, as a senator, she would have been uh, quite familiar with the inner workings of OSHA, with the regulatory agenda of OSHA, uh, and with, you know, OSHA enforcement and regulatory issues in a general level. So this is an area that she has focused on in her public career. Uh, we know as a senator that she was one of the senators who supported the Protecting America's Workers Act. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, what, that, what that legislation is uh, and, and if there is a Clinton administration, if it's something she's likely to advance and what that means for employers. Uh, we also know from her history in the Senate that she was active in advancing uh, the post 9-11 responders uh, Health care benefits uh, uh, issues, those initiatives. And so she was very much involved in chemical exposure, understanding chemical exposure hazards in the workplace, um, and, and really taking a, um, a great interest in that and advancing legislation um, directly related to that. So again, this shows that safety and health, I think, is uh, not an afterthought for her. You know, like when President Obama uh, became president. He had really no history with OSHA worker safety issues, so we could assume that he would take a progressive liberal approach to OSHA regulatory issues, but you'd never seen him, you know, sort of act on those issues before. They'd never been priority to him. Very different situation with uh, Hillary Clinton in her public life. She has been active on safety and health issues, uh, likewise being a strong advocate for the Cranes and Derricks rule, which was promulgated um, during the Obama administration. And then finally, I mentioned a moment ago that the ergonomics rule, which was a focal point of President Bill Clinton's, Clinton's administration, but was defeated by Republicans in Congress, uh, perhaps is an issue that would be important to Hillary Clinton as well if she were to become the president. Uh, so this is, to me, what I think is the, you know, from an OSHA standpoint, and I know this election is about so many other and perhaps more important things, 
But as a OSHA defense attorney, I put my OSHA blinders on and say, what's the biggest thing that could happen uh, depending on the outcome of this election? And I think it is uh, OSH Act reform legislation uh, and the, what, what it will almost certainly be called is the Protecting America's Workers Act. There has been some iteration or another of the Protecting America's Workers Act floating around Congress for the last couple of decades. Uh, and we do know that as a senator, this was a, uh, an issue that Hillary supported. Uh, I don't think she was a sponsor of the bill, but she uh, did make public statements in support of it. Uh, it is an issue that I know she does and would support if she were to become the president. So what does that mean if there was um, you know, enough political capital from a, uh, from a President Clinton election and enough um, uh, change in the makeup of Congress? we could see the Protecting America's Workers Act move through Congress and get signed into law. This act, the versions that we've seen over the last several years, have been focused on these reforms. One, to increase civil and criminal penalties, you know, the actual dollar amounts that would be available to the government uh, in charges under the OSH Act for uh, violations of OSHA standards or criminal charges uh, based on a variety of different um, uh, potential violations. The other thing and most significant thing I think about the PAWA that we have seen is that um, it would intend to make it much easier to prosecute individuals, individual managers, corporate officers, or uh, direct supervisors that are involved in a serious incident. The criminal charges could be brought against those individuals rather than a corporate criminal charge, which has really been what has um, uh, the few criminal prosecutions we've seen of worker uh, safety issues over the last 40 years have almost exclusively been corporate charges. This reform would make it easier to charge individuals. Uh, the other thing that it would do is it would make it would make bringing a charge more attractive to a prosecutor by changing the criminal charge from a misdemeanor to a felony, making it you know worth the investment to a prosecutor, so to speak. Uh, PAWA would increase whistleblower protections for safety and health, uh, protected safety actions. It would require OSHA to inspect all deaths and serious injuries. Right now, OSHA is required to open an inspection of all fatality cases, but not all serious injury cases. So if this legislation were enacted and OSHA was mandated to inspect or investigate all serious injuries, we would almost certainly see a significant uh, budget increase to the agency to facilitate doing these many more uh, inspections, which would mean significant, uh, significantly more enforcement. Uh, the PAWA would also expand victims, employees, and unions' rights in the inspection and enforcement process uh, and would make some changes to available settlement uh, outcomes like recharacterizing willful violations to unclassified. Uh, the last thing we could say about uh, a potential Clinton administration, what OSHA would look like, is that um, uh, you know, her track record in Senate suggests that we would see more of the same of what we've seen from Obama over the last uh, seven and a half years. And that means more inspections, uh, more citations, more of a focus on finding and citing more repeat violations, higher civil penalties, both from a policy standpoint to drive up min minimum penalties and continuing to implement the, um, uh, the recent Bipartisan Budget Act which calls for an annual increase in civil penalties for OSHA, uh, we would certainly see a Clinton administration uh, implement those annual increases, whereas a Trump administration probably would not. Um, I think we would see uh, heavy use of the severe violator enforcement program, more and more um, uh, 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 items, uh, employers being qualified into that program. Uh, I think we would see more criminal prosecutions. We've seen an effort in the final year of the Obama administration to pursue more worker safety criminal um, uh, cases. Uh, and I think that that would be a carryover to a Clinton administration if that's what happens after election day. Uh, I think we would certainly see a continuation of the public shaming uh, uh, effort that the Obama administration took to all new levels with four or five times more um, post citation enforcement press releases with nasty and inflammatory, embarrassing language about employers. I think we would certainly see that, initiate, uh, this, that initiative carry over to a Clinton OSHA. Uh, we would see the continued trend of more, um, uh, more whistleblower cases 
uh, both on the safety and health front and generally uh, all of the different statutes that OSHA is charged with implementing uh, the whistleblower provisions. And then we would, I think, see very significantly a Clinton administration would implement the FAR blacklisting rule, which has just become a final rule, which is very controversial, not only from a safety and health standpoint, uh, but, but all labor laws. And this is for federal government contractors who may uh, see their ability to contract with the government or the terms of their contracting with the government significantly impacted by alleged uh, labor law violations, including OSHA violations. So I think a Clinton administration would certainly advance that initiative as well. Talked about the ergonomics issue already, but to me this is a major, major regulatory piece uh, that I would look out for in a Clinton administration because it was so, so important to the Bill Clinton administration. Uh, and it is, you hear OSHA talk about the incredible amounts of ergonomic injuries we see in our workplaces, the incredible amounts of money spent by employers uh, uh, dealing with ergonomics issues. Uh, it is the elephant in the room when it comes to OSHA and OSHA enforcement, and there has been you know, no effective enforcement policy by OSHA dealing with ergonomics really for the last 20 plus years. Um, so I think this is something that we could see a Hillary Clinton uh, OSHA try to tackle. Now, what about on the other side of this from Trump? We talked a little bit about his personal history. So whereas uh, you know, Trump comes from a business standpoint, uh, is not uh, very well informed in, in my observation about uh, the operations of government. And that may be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your perspective. But it does strike me that there's not a lot of familiarity with a lot of the workings of government agencies. But I think OSHA is different in that regard. I think Trump has a lot of personal visibility into the way OSHA operates, what its role is, and how it can be a force for good or bad, uh, depending on your perspective. And I think because of that unique, you know, the fact that he has more knowledge and experience with OSHA than other regulatory agencies, I could see him when he starts digging in and looking for places to make these 85 to 90 percent regulatory cuts that he's talked about, that OSHA would be a prime candidate for that. So you could see, I think, early in a Trump administration, a focus on trying to scale back some of the things that were done uh, by the Obama administration. Um, so what do we think? How is Trump going to make OSHA great again? Uh, you know, his view of that would be to scale back the regulatory burdens, uh, go back to really the, the, the uh, President George W. Bush model of OSHA with a much heavier focus on compliance assistance with a scaled down focus on um, enforcement, and then certainly a significantly scaled down focus on regulatory, uh, pro, you know, regulatory activities, the making of new rules, and in fact, we would expect to see the contrary. And here's a list of things that I, th I think would be prime targets early in a Trump presidency for scaling back uh, OSHA regulatory activities. We just saw civil uh, penalties increase by 80%. Um, and, and that same piece of legislation that pushed penalties to jump by 80% also would require an annual increase in civil penalties based on the rise in consumer price index year over year. I think we would see a Trump uh, presidency, and certainly if it was um, in conjunction with a Republican Congress, we would see that legislation undone, and we would see either the civil penalties go back to where they were, or at least we'd stymie the, um, the annual increases uh, that are set to proceed under that legislation. The other very significant rule that is, you know, practically every phone call I get these days is about the new electronic record keeping rule and anti-retaliation rule. Uh, that rule was just published in the final register. Uh, it is not effective yet. The anti-retaliation elements are set to become effective December 1st and the actual electronic data submission elements are set to go into effect in the middle of, uh, of next year, of 2017. And industry has taken a very negative view uh, of this rule, both the data submission, or more importantly, the data publication, which OSHA intends to do, and the anti-retaliation provisions, which would cut into your um, uh, post-incident drug testing, your um, uh, safety incentive programs, management compensation, and things like that. Uh, and both are subject to legal challenge right now. 
And I could certainly see a Trump administration and OSHA under a Trump administration um, undoing that regulatory um, uh, action that was done very late in the Obama administration. Similarly, we've seen a significant growth in whistleblower protections over the last three or four years of the Obama administration. I think those would be a prime target uh, for repeal or reform uh, under a Trump presidency. And then the other you know, really major change that happened during the Obama administration from an OSHA standpoint was changing the, um, the types of incidents that employers are required to report to OSHA proactively. It used to be you know, catastrophes, hospitalization of three or more employees, and that was reduced now to the hospitalization of a single employee uh, as well as minor amputations uh, and, and more significant amputations. Uh, I could see those reporting criteria reformed under a Trump presidency as well uh, so that there would be uh, less federal government intervention in the workplace, less interaction between employers uh, and OSHA going forward. The last really significant thing, oh, the other thing that I think is, is important there, although it's not on the slide, is I talked about Clinton advancing the FAR blacklisting rule. I think without a doubt a Trump presidency uh, would take steps to undo uh, that, that regulatory um, advancement. And we would, we would see the blacklisting rule, I think, would go away or would be significantly modified, perhaps to include um, uh, entities that contract with uh, the Department of Defense, which is the vast majority of federal government contracting. Uh, so that would be something else to really track, because that's a new rule recently published in the Federal Register that's not effective yet. Uh, we could see that uh, really uh, taken apart by uh, a Trump uh, administration. Although this presentation is really about the presidential election, I think that uh, I know that the idea, a lot of the things we've talked about under what a Clinton administration would look like probably scare employers. I think something that is even scarier is the prospect of what may happen uh, in Congress. Uh, the, for the House to turn to the Democrats, there would need to be a 30-seat uh, swing, and of course all um, seats are up for election this year. In the Senate, only four seat swing would be necessary uh, to take the Senate from Republican control to Democratic control. So you would see the potential in this election for both houses uh, to flip to the Democrats. If that were to happen, in particular, if that were to happen in the Senate, one thing that should be uh, somewhat alarming to employers is that one of the things that I'm hearing uh, from Bernie Sanders is that in exchange for the support that he has lent to the Clinton campaign that he would like uh, as a reward uh, to become the ranking Democrat on the Senate Health Committee, the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, which is the committee that has oversight over OSHA, as well as many of other uh, Bernie's other very progressive priority issues. Um, if you have, you know, the Democrats in control of the Senate, and Bernie Sanders as the ranking Democrat on the Senate Health Committee, I think we could see an incredibly aggressive anti-employer agenda that touches all aspects of worker safety, wage and hour issues, uh, you know, advancing the cause of unions, and absolutely uh, worker safety uh, issues as well. So those are you know, all the things to look out for and to think about as we head to the polls uh, in just a couple of weeks. I'm going to turn it over to Nick now to talk about what would happen uh, to our mine safety regulatory and enforcement uh, arena as well. All right, thank you and hello everybody. Uh, we're gonna take some time and talk about potential impacts on uh, the Mine Safety and Health Administration, which you know, quite frankly, we could uh, just in change out the M for the O uh, on OSHA and a lot of it will be the same uh, in terms of the overall impacts and overall um, outlook. So when we look at that, we can just look at the background uh, of MSHA a bit. The agency itself has largely been bipartisan, and that is because it has been reactionary in its major law enforcements and major law creations, uh, such as the Minor Act of 2006 and the Mine Act uh, of 1977, both followed a series of mine disasters, and that was the driving force behind the laws. 
Um, you know, one thing that we have seen from Pre or Secretary Clinton is that if she becomes president, she wants to look at having a more proactive approach to the Mine Safety and Health Administration um, to get away from these reactionary move or reactionary laws. Um, you know, as we can see, the Mine Act of 1977, there was two uh, significant disasters in 76 and 77 um, that resulted in a number of fatalities. Um, and that was the impetus that pushed forward the Mine Act, uh, which was signed by President Carter. Um, subsequently, the next major development uh, for the Mine Safety and Health Administration was in 2006. Um, which they just celebrated the 10-year anniversary of the Miner Act, uh, which was for Mine Improvement and New Emergency Response Act. And that was following three separate disasters in 2006, two within a month of January. Um, and those stemmed all in underground coal mines from uh, the 2006 incidents, going from expl two explosions and one having to do with fire and evacuation. So the Miner Act, what changed with that was we looked quite a bit more at how we are going to respond to, uh, I'm sorry, how we're going to respond to emergencies, the development of new regulations on emergency response teams and provisions. Um, additionally, this was the creation and implementation of MSHA's 15 minute rule with regard to calling them uh, if an event such as a fatality or one that could lead to a fatality occurs at a mine, um, which is quite different and a bit more stringent than uh, the complementary ones under OSHA, which I believe are eight and 24 hours. Um, so 15 minutes is a quick turnaround. You know, so if we're looking at though, what is the next possible change that we can see? You know, obviously MSHA is pushing forward with their own regulatory agenda. Um, and we've seen that in terms of they want to reform, reform the way they assess penalties and issue citations. Uh, they're also pushing on the metal non-metal side for a review and a uh, reworking of the requirements for workplace exams. Um, but the big change that could come, the next big change that we could see is really the Bird Mine Safety Protection Act. Um, and similar to the Protecting America's Worker, this has been floating around for a number of years. Um, and this is an act that would give AMTRA quite a bit more teeth. Uh, and it's important to bring this up now because this is really, if there is a continuation, as Eric said, it's going to give the administration or the agencies the ability to keep pushing forward a uh, progressive agenda. And this is the next step in that. And it would increase civil and criminal penalties. Um, it would lower the threshold for what constitutes a significant substantial or SNS violation. Uh, it allows MSHA to shut down any operation who has delinquent fines or fails to pay uh, final orders. It would give injunctive relief as well as increased training requirements um, and give additional whistleblower protections to minors for discrimination claims, including uh, and up to punitive damages. Uh, nonetheless, they would also be giving an immediate reinstatement for uh, retaliation claims, even if MSHA does not provide representation for the minor. And if MSHA does shut down an operation, uh, the mine would be required to provide full pay to minors for a maximum of 60 days. So, you know, as we can see, there's been a push throughout the current administration to really look at the use of withdrawal orders, whether that be imminent dangers or 104D orders, um, as a tool to remove areas that are deemed unsafe from operation. Uh, and the Bird Mine Act would not only allow them to do so for failure to pay penalties, but it would give inspectors much more authority to shut down entire operations instead of certain portions. And during that time, we would still have to pay the employees. So what would we look like if there was a President Trump in office? Um, as Eric said on health and safety topics, there is not a lot of uh, documentation on his platform. And 
the GOP platform uh, lacks any specific reference or guidance to MSHA as well. Um, it really, you know, is not the hot button issue was in 2008, which was following immediately after the 2006 mine disasters and the Miner Act getting passed. Um, and MSHA isn't garnering as much attention uh, in the media. But what we do know is that the regulatory outline is going to be to cut regulation, to put a moratorium on new regulations, um, as well as he wants to replace agency leaders with persons uh, who will be tasked with reviewing and reducing regulation. Um, so when we look at that, we look at, you know, what is going to be pulled from the table. You know, obviously, I think that the Part 100 regulations are going to be removed uh, from their pending status. Um, as well, we're going to have a new head of the agency. And right now we have uh, Undersecretary Joe Main, and he came and he's been with the agency since 2009, which is really a unprecedented stretch um, of consistency to push forth the agenda. And he came from the union, the United Mine Workers. So with a Trump presidency, we'd likely see someone similar to what we saw with President Bush, who was coming from industry. And that would, you know, most likely change the focus from enforcement to compliance assistance. Um, specifically, Trump has promised that he's going to reopen the coal mines and bring that back. We're going to get the mines open, as he says. However, his focus on this seems to be more on the environmental regulations versus safety and health. Um, he stated that he believes that the mines are already safe due to uh, the engineering and the developments over the last 10 years. Um, and he particularly focuses on the EPA quite a bit. Um, the waters of the U.S., which is a big concern for the mining industry and the uh, expansion of the definition of a waterway, is something that he has vowed to remove as an oppressive regulation killing business. So when we look at that, we can see that he is really focusing on, again, reopening the mines, or at least that's his stance. However, he's looking more so at his energy policy and his uh, environmental policy as the way that happens through removing some of the Clean Air Act regulations, which will increase in his position, the production of coal and its use in power plants, as well as some of the EPA restrictions over water. Uh, he does not provide a lot of guidance on how the Mine Safety and Health Administration or the workplace safety aspects will be affected. So if we have a Clinton administration, how is that going to change the outlook? Well, it will be similar to what it is now, but as we said, there is a chance that things could become much more stringent with AMSHA and that they would get additional um, regulatory support for moving forward on regulations and for increasing their power in the industry. Um, under President Clinton, uh, or President Clinton, we obviously know that there is a bit of history. She was a senator from 2001 to 2009. In that time, she was a co-sponsor of the Federal Mine Safety and Health Act of 2006. Um, additionally, she helped and pushed forward the agenda of the Miner Act. Um, at that time, in 2000 eight when she ran, uh, she actually provided a detailed mine safety and health agenda. Um, that was not provided this time around, but if we look back at that, it's most likely that her position has not changed that much. And that agenda really read like a summary of the Bird Mine Safety and Protection Act, uh, stating that a President Clinton would look, seek to double the maximum penalties. Um, which currently our statutory maximum for something that is a regularly assessed penalty is uh, just about $68,000. So she would be searching for the tools to double these. Um, and then she's also going to <clears throat> give a greater authority to inspectors to shut down operations. Um, and this is a continuation, if that were to be the case, of what we've seen now. We have seen through the Obama administration um, a renewed emphasis on the use of imminent danger orders by mine inspectors, uh, encouraging them to use these as a means to remove certain areas or certain equipment from operation. Um, and when this happens, operators are going to have to abate the condition and 
prove that is now a safe way to operate or that the equipment is safe to operate. Um, and this is a tool that a President Clinton would likely see to expand to the entire mine. Um, again, a big concern uh, that has been voiced in her responses or discussion of the Mine Safety and Health Administration is to shut down operations who are failing to pay fines. Um, this goes back to the Darby Mine disaster in Kentucky in 2006, in which after the incident occurred, which was an explosion, uh, it was determined that the operation had hundreds of thousands in delinquent fines and that the owners of that operation had been shuffling around into different corporate entities and not paying the. So that is really the root of where that um, has come. In addition, you know, the MSHA has the ability to turn over collections to the Treasury, um, which they are doing more frequently now. However, for a long time prior to the current administration, delinquent fines were just kind of left out and, and not looked to. So uh, she would make moves to, or likely make moves to remedy that by allowing MSHA to stop production. Um, additionally, there will be the continued support of whistleblowers um, of all types. And indeed, uh, in 2008, uh, then Senator Clinton said that she wanted to create a new and independent office of minor ombudsman, um, which would receive all complaints of operator violations or safety and health and hazard complaints and help the whistleblowers with their cases. As we talked about in uh, the proposal for the Bird Mine Safety Protection Act, they want to supply reinstatement, whether financial or actual, for minors, even if MSHA does not take forward the case, which at this point, temporary reinstatement is only available when MSHA takes a case forward. And then lastly, they are going to keep MSHA with the staffing and funding that they need to pursue these aggressive uh, initiatives. And that is one thing that then Senator Clinton really focused on that the um, Bush administration was removing funding. Now, we've seen increases um, in funding for the safety and health agencies, and just recently it was a bit of a decline, but overall the funding has increased under the Obama administration. We would look for that to continue. So when we look at it, we really look at the nuts and bolts. Uh, President Trump would likely reduce enforcement, uh, focus more on compliance assistance around the industry. We would see reduction in new regulation um, and pro probable abandonment of proposed rules, such as the workplace exam changes, which still could be finalized before the end of the Obama administration, uh, but also the Part 100, which would seek to reform the way that penalties are assessed and cited. Um, with President Clinton, we would likely see an enforce, uh, increased enforcement resources, a continuation of the aggressive uh, initiatives such as the Rules to Live By initiative uh, and the use of withdrawal orders, um, as well as a continued rulemaking. We would likely see the EMSHA's version of the OSHA silica rule come uh, into being, as well as a possibility for the Bird Mine Safety Protection Act, um, especially if they're uh, is unfortunately a mining disaster that could happen in the future that would likely get pushed forward rather aggressively. So with that, uh, that is where we are at with the MSHA side of things, and I'll turn it over to Eric to complete. All right, so that was sort of a review of the, the three different uh, areas where we practice, what we think uh, the administrations uh, would look like or the different faces of the administrations what they might look like um, if uh, you know depending on the outcome of the upcoming election um, w you know we have uh, would also encourage you to check out uh, our blogs uh, for more information about you know what OSHA is doing presently what it may do in the future and uh, hot uh, issues on the OSHA front we've got the OSHA defense report on the labor and employment uh, uh, law side we've got the employer defense report and on the MSHA front we've got the MSHA defense report as well um, I do see we might have a couple of questions we'll address here before we um, we hang it up um, there was a question about the far blacklisting rule um, 
you know, what that is and what it may mean. But before I talk about that a little bit, uh, there was news today that um, there is a legal challenge to that rule. It's been published in the Federal Register. It's not effective yet, uh, and it's been challenged as an unlawful rulemaking. And the district court in Texas that is hearing the legal challenge granted a preliminary injunction today. Um, so I haven't read the full uh, uh, order yet, so I, I don't know all the details, but it does look like there will be a delay in implementing um, uh, a delay in implementing and enforcing that new regulation pending the outcome of the uh, full legal challenge. Uh, but to grant a preliminary injunction, there you know must be a conclusion by this district court judge uh, that there is a likely success on the merits of the legal challenge as well as imminent uh, or, or irreparable harm that will be caused if it goes into effect pending the full review. Uh, so that is a significant de development on the far rule and I think a really uh, important sign of how this next election can be very important because it's indefinitely stayed uh, but it could go into effect um, uh, but there will be time for whomever the next president is to do something about that. Um, so uh, let's see there's another question about injunctive relief that I think must have to do with something in one of the, the Mine Act uh, issues. So the question is what does injunctive relief in terms of uh, the Bird Mine Safety Protection Act mean, uh, it would give MSHA the ability to, um, or greater ability to require changes in the operations uh, specific to how things are completed or maybe the tools that are used for it uh, outside of just the citation protocol. So it would uh, give them the ability to put down some type of enforcement action um, through an injunctive injunction. And if the operator failed to comply with that, there could be greater penalties or uh, even criminal charges. Someone has asked whether the slide presentation will be available to attendees. Absolutely. After this call, um, we will be able to circulate not only the slides, but also the recording of the webinar for those of you who might have had colleagues who were unable to attend today and want to share the information. Um, we're happy to do that.